Hello and welcome to the first QA recorded study guide. Um, the study guide that you have in front of you has the terms that we are going to talk about and that are important. The things here on the screen may be a little different. For example, First Americans is not on your study guide, but it is important for me to talk about it just to set up some of the other terms. Now, should you know a little bit about the First Americans and stuff like that? Yes. Did I think it was important to put on the study guide? No. Um, so you need to figure out what you really need to write about the First Americans. But I would be focusing on the terms that are on your study guide. Just to recap, the First Americans, if you're looking at this map, they are going to be people that are crossing the land bridge from Siberia over to North America and then spreading out over the years, going their separate ways and forming their own societies. Because they are going to be forming their own societies, they are going to start having different ways of living. And a big way that they are different is broken up into these three categories right here. Sedentary, semi-sedentary, and non-sedentary. And all of these can be found on page six. They are bulleted points in your book explaining what each of them are. So you need to know the difference between each of these three things. You need to know that sedentary is they stay in one place. It's permanent. It They don't move. Large cities, wide streets, marketplaces. Semi-sedentary are groups of people that are going to stay in one place for a few years, but then move. So they're semi-sedentary staying in one place for like four to five years and then they'll pick up and move. Um, that's not permanent villages, they're not permanent towns, but um, they do stay in one place for a little while. But then the, the non-sedentary are always moving, looking for food. So you kind of have, starting at the top, you have sedentary that stay in one place, and then non-sedentary is the opposite of that because it's non-sedentary, and that means they're always moving. Um, a way to remember this that I talk about is if you live a sedentary lifestyle, that is the opposite of an active lifestyle, and that means a sedentary lifestyle is one where you don't exercise, you just stay on the couch, and if you stay on the couch, what happens to you? You get large just like these cities did. If you are constantly moving all over the place, you constantly are needing to, you know, get energy somehow and or get food somehow because you're you're using all of your energy, you're exercising and you're burning all of that those calories that you're taking in. So, um non-sedentary people are always moving and looking for food and always trying to find stuff. And they are the opposite of these sedentary large cities, wide streets, marketplaces, getting very large, getting very big, sedentary lifestyle, couch potato. Um, that's kind of how I would try to remember it. So now if we move away from the first people in America and the stuff like that, we move on to the Renaissance and Reformation. The reason that we talk about the Renaissance and Reformation is because in Europe at this time, things are going bad because we have things like the Black Death, the Great Famine, Hundred Years' War, kills a whole bunch of people. Um, if you remember, the Black Death was spread in this kind of manner. The fleas get infected by the rats, and then the flea bites this sad little dude, and he lays down and dies, and all that kind of stuff. So things are getting bad in Europe, but they start turning around because of these things right here, the Renaissance and the Reformation. The Renaissance is on page 18 and 19. You need to understand that both of these movements, which is what we call them, movements, um, have a great effect on the way people live in Europe because before this, you know, We've got Black Death, Great Famine, 100 Years War. Nobody's really focused on learning much. They're all focused on surviving. 
but that changes with the Renaissance. Before the Renaissance, people were more worried about getting bit by those fleas and dying and not really thinking about taking care of themselves and learning and, you know, learning more about the world. They were just focused on not dying. I, I give the example is if you were in school and you have a test on Friday and on Monday you realize that 20 people around you are not here at school because they've died from some mysterious disease and then on Tuesday 20 more people and Wednesday 20 more and it's just spreading from all around you aren't really going to be focusing on studying for that test on Friday you're gonna be focusing on how am I going to survive and not get this awful disease but once that kind of situation stops in Europe we see the Renaissance, which leads to more education. Um, a so education, uh, art, math, things like this that are all important, and people start learning. People start wanting to better themselves, focus on education, and all this kind of stuff. The second movement that we look at is the Reformation, and the Reformation is basically it has to do with the church. We have two groups. Uh, we have the Catholics and the Protestants. And basically, it is about reforming the church. So if we look at the word reformation, you can see right here that reform is in the word. Um, it splits off into two groups. You have the Catholics who follow the Pope and the Protestants who want to break away. The new religion that comes into play here is, are the Protestants. The Protestants are a completely new re religion that come of the Reformation, so that's important to know. So there, this, invention, this invention called the printing press helps grow these two movements, helps spread the word of these two movements. Um, this is a picture of the printing press. The printing press can be found on page 19, and what we're talking about here is it makes books can be printed faster. Because these books can be printed faster, more people are buying them and more people are reading, and that means that the ideas of the Reformation and the Renaissance up here are spreading. And also what is spreading is just like a curiosity about the world. So more books, more reading, more knowledge, the printing press leads to interest in world exploration. So the printing press leads us to this interest in world exploration, more people going out, getting curious about the world, and once they are getting more curious about the world, they start going over there. And one of the first countries that is going to be exploring in the new world would be the Spanish. And once the Spanish realize that they want to set up colonies in the new world, they are going to start taking over the land. And the only problem with the Spanish just saying, oh, this is our land and we would like to have this, is that there are a whole bunch of people already living there. So we start with the Aztecs, um, and those, this uh, story can be found on page 31 and 32. We look at the Aztecs, and first we have to remember that the person that is leading the Spanish conquest of the... Aztecs is Hernando Cortez. So you have to associate Hernando Cortez with the Aztecs. You you can't you cannot forget that those two things go together. So um, Hernando Cortez, because the Aztecs are in Mexico, the Hernando Cortez leads his 508 conquistadors into Mexico and where he's facing, you know, all of these Aztecs. And, you know, he marches into Tenochtitlan, which is the capital and um, city of the Aztecs. And and you have the La, La Noche Triste, or the sad night where a whole bunch of people die. But he comes back and he finally conquers the Aztecs. And um, we're going to get to some of the reasons why they conquer the Aztecs or some of the reasons the Spanish are so successful here in just a little bit but we'll talk about that after we look at the fall of the Incas which you know kinda of follows the same path as the 
Aztecs. You need to remember Incas, um, Peru. They're in Peru, which is on this map right here. Um, it would be in this area right here. So you have the Aztecs in Peru. And what you need to kind of focus on for this is to remember that, you know, Francisco Pizarro conquers the Incas. So you have the Incas and Pizarro, Cortez and the Aztecs. Remember, Peru starts with a P. Inca has Inca has four letters. Peru has four letters. Um, Peru starts with a P. Pizarro starts with a P. So kind of make all of these connections to help you remember. This can be found, both of these things can be found on page 32. Um, what you kind of need to get out of the fall of the Aztecs and the fall of the Incas is, you know, what allows the Spanish, I mean, Francisco Pizarro has 180 people that he comes in with. And then Cortez only has 508. So we're talking about a very small amount of people. The Incas influence 10 million people. So there are, they are very outnumbered. So what allows the Spanish to conquer these vast empires so easily? One thing you have to remember is that the Spanish make allies with the, the enemies of the Incas and the Aztecs. Can't forget that the European diseases that are spread have a huge impact on the Native American population. And then the last thing that you need to remember is that the Spanish were rather brutal to these people. So Francisco Pizarro, Hernando Cortez, the Spanish come in, they conquer them, the allies, the diseases... All of these things. All right, let's move right along to the other European nations, um, other than Spain, and talking about the Northwest Passage. When we look at the Northwest Passage, what you kind of need to... Well, first of all, we're looking at Chapter 2, Section 2, Page 35. I mean, what you need to kind of remember is that these people have no idea kind of what land they're looking at or where they're going or anything like that. So they're leaving from Europe and they think maybe they can go over this area of land and sail off. And what they want to do is they want to get to Asia. So the Northwest Passage, is, they are all trying to get to Asia. And the problem, as we've talked about with trying to go over that little land area, is that, you know, you have Canada in the way. So Canada kind of ruins that plan. Always ruining everything, Canada. Um, so the Northwest Passage, they're trying to get to Asia, quicker trade route. It doesn't exist, so that's important to remember. But another thing to kind of just focus on a little bit is some of the main names that are going to be looking for the Northwest Passage, John Cabot, Henry Hudson, Jack Carter, all these people are going to be found around page 35, 37, things like 38, nothing, I mean, you don't really know. need to know huge specifics about them, need to focus on the fact that they are looking for, and they will never find, this all-water route to Asia over the North American continent, known as the Northwest Passage. So... Henry Hudson, Jock Carter. All right, let's get down here to defeat of the Spanish Armada. Now, if we remember back to the line of demarcation and the Treaty of Tordesilla, we have a huge map of the world, let's say, and you have the Pope who draws a line down the middle of it, and then they move the line a little bit. So what you have is the tr Treaty of Tordesilla, which says that everything on this side is going to be Spanish, and everything on this side is going to be Portugal. Um, so what this does is this says that all of this land over here is Spanish, and if all of this stuff over here has Spain's name all over it. Now, if, if the English are coming over here, leaving from England, and leaving from England and coming over and exploring all of this area and trying to get the Northwest Passage and all that kind of stuff, 
they are kind of stepping on Spain's territory. But the thing is, England doesn't care that the Pope drew a line there and said that it's theirs because England is Protestant and Queen Elizabeth up here is Protestant, so she wants to take over this land and she doesn't really care what the Spanish have to say about it. So the Spanish kind of get angry, and what makes them even angrier is what Queen Elizabeth does. What she does is send Sir Francis Drake on this journey around the world, leaving from England, going around the tip of South America, and then stealing all of this stuff from the Spanish, just raiding all of these ports along the way. And this makes Spain really angry. So what do they do? They send some of their ships called the Spanish Armada into the English Channel to take over England and, you know, make them under Spain's control. So we're looking at this on page 37. And, you know, that's kind of the story of why it happens. And then you have to realize that what happens is England wins. And because England wins, it proves that that England can def defend itself and it's going to remain Protestant and that Spain can be defeated. And the important part about Spain being defeated is that Spain no longer dominates the you know Atlantic Ocean or the North American continent or the South well, the North American continent. So the other countries especially England, now feel comfortable going over there and exploring and setting up their colonies and all of this kind of stuff. So um, when we look at Spanish missions, which is the next thing on your study guide, we're looking at page 43. Um, this is a little picture of what a Spanish m mission might have looked like. So the main goal of a, a mission is uh, basically a settlement with a church. Um, and the main goal is that they want to convert Native Americans to Christianity. So that's what you really need to know. They want to convert Native Americans to Christianity. That's the main goal. All right, moving on to Columbian Exchange. That is on the next page, page 44. This is a picture that I'm sure you are all familiar with by now. Um, of the Columbian Exchange, we have things leaving from Europe or the the Eastern Hemisphere coming to the Western Hemisphere and coming from the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere. So we're talking about the transfer or movement of plants, animals, and diseases in between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere. Now, some things were good like pumpkins and turkeys and all this kind of stuff. Like before the Columbian Exchange, there were no pumpkins in Europe. Before the Columbian Exchange, there were no turkeys in Europe. And there were no cows in North America. But because of this, people are bringing things, taking things back, all of this kind of stuff. And it's this movement of plants, animals. And not all of them are positive because we have that last thing, diseases. Which is what we talked a little bit about with the fall of the Aztecs and the Incas is you know these dis European diseases that these Native Americans have no immunity to they catch the disease they die very quickly um, and a lot of them died 90 to 95 percent in Central America 20 million you know that's a lot of people so um, another negative effect is something that we look at when we talk about African slaves and that is going to be starting on page 50 and that's chapter 2 section 4 um, kinda what you need to remember about or what you need to kinda focus on is you know why did the Spanish use start using African slaves instead of Native American slaves um, remember that the Native American slaves we just talked about the Native Americans dying very quickly because of the diseases um, and what happens is they realize that Native Americans also have allies very close by and they can just run away and they know the territory or they can be saved. The African slaves were talking about, you know, not really having allies in the Americas because they are from Africa and they don't have friends and family around. And um, they're immune to the diseases. They kind of know how to work on 
some of these plantations and they are they are what the Spanish need instead of using Native Americans alright so that is the end of kind of reviewing for unit one let's move on to unit two a little quicker um, so yes moving on in unit two we look at the English coming over and setting up the first English colonies in America you have to kind of understand why these English colonies are being set up and it's kind of broken down into two reasons both from the government perspective like the English government and then why the people themselves came over so for the English government we're talking about they just want to come over to make some money off these colonies uh, and that starts with Sir Walter Raleigh who is an understudy guide but um, we should all know about Sir Walter Raleigh first guy to come over and set up English colonies he fails miserably all that good stuff but the reason that the people came over the most most of the early settlements are set up because these people are religious groups are members of religious groups like the Puritans and the Pilgrims who we'll talk about in a little bit but they want to seek out religious freedom and that that's why the majority of these people are coming over so the colonies the majority of them are set up because it's religious groups uh, seeking religious freedom and the thing that you also have to remember is that these early colonies fail like Sir Walter Raleigh has Virginia and Roanoke and those both fail miserably but the first successful English colony is Jamestown here's a picture of Jamestown this Jamestown is found on page 63 through 64 and the thing that you need to remember about Jamestown is obviously it's the first successful or permanent English settlement but also that this crop right here tobacco saved Jamestown because they start growing it and they start making money and because they start making money more people want to come over to Jamestown which makes it larger makes it prosper because they are growing a lot of tobacco they are then selling it and that is making England money and that brings us to the next term on your study guide which is mercantilism mercantilism can be found on page 62 so you gotta go back just a little bit but the idea here is that the colony produces some sort of raw material um, in the Jamestown case it is tobacco in this picture's case it is a beaver but it's the fur of the beaver um, this beaver is trapped and killed once again sorry to be so graphic if you wanted to see this beaver live sorry it's gonna be turned into a hat so the fur from this beaver that is trapped and killed in the colony is sent over to England it is made into a hat and then it is sold and because the home country or England has a lot of colonies they can produce a lot of furs and they can produce a lot of hats which means they're selling a lot of stuff this is what mercantilism is it is selling more than you buy selling more goods than you buy and that is gonna make them money and without colonies this system doesn't work very well especially if you're a smaller country like England because you can't produce as many goods if you don't have as much land alright now what ends up happening is that the colonists are you know doing all of these things for the country and they're making a lot of money but they aren't really having any say about anything in the colony so what they want to do is have some a voice in their government and a voice in how much taxes should be or anything like that so on page 64 to 65 they talk about the house of Burgesses um, people in Jamestown maybe one year are going to pay 10 percent in taxes and then the next year without them having any say it goes up to 20 percent and then 30 percent or whatever and it's going up without them having a say in how much taxes should be the problem with that is they it's not that they don't want to pay taxes is that they they want to have a say in how much taxes should be um, it would be like you waking up in the morning unplugging your phone from the cell phone charger and going and somebody saying okay that's five dollars um, if you want to use your phone that's five dollars 
and you didn't have any vote in this. It's just that's just how things are now. And then maybe a month later, it's ten dollars, and it just keeps on getting more and more, and nobody is asking you or letting you vote. What the House of Burgesses does is it sets up the first representative form of government in the colonies. So it's the first representative form of government in the colonies. And we talked about represent, representative government um, by saying, you know, if the school has a school-wide vote, if it was a representative government or a representative school government, you each class would pick one person from that class to go up to the office and vote in the way that the, the majority of people in our class want to vote. So they would go up to the office and represent us in the office by voting yes or no, or however the majority of the people in class wanted to vote. Um, so the House of Burgess' first form of representative government in the colonies. Um, what happens to Jamestown um, is that it gets taken over by the king because he he says that he's worried about you know some Indian rebel or Native American rebellions and stuff like that. But um, basically, what happens is it becomes a royal colony, and the definition for royal colony can be found on page 65. But it's pretty simple to remember what a royal colony is. It's a colony that is run by the king. So uh, I mean, it's royal. The king's a member of the royal family. All right, let's uh, move on to chapter 3, section 2. We're looking at the dissenters. A dissenter is somebody that disagrees, so disagrees with the establishment. Um, in this case, we're talking about the church. When we look at the pilgrims, we're looking at page 68. Um, remember, the pilgrims, before they were the pilgrims, were the separatists. They come over to America because they are being persecuted um, they don't like the Church of England. They want to separate from it because they are separatists. So they separate and leave, and they become pilgrims when they come to America. They ride over on the Mayflower. And because they land outside of the rule of the English, they set up their own document with their own rules called the Mayflower Compact, which is on page 68. And the Mayflower Compact is the pilgrims' document that they write that sets up their government, their rules, their laws. Another group of dissenters are the Puritans, and the Puritans can be found on page 68 as well. And what you really need to look at with the Puritans is that, you know, they want to purify, they want to reform the church, they want to, you know, make it better. They don't necessarily want to break away like the separatists or the pilgrims do, but what ends up happening is they're, they get persecuted just like the separatists, so they have to end up moving and leaving anyway. So they come over to the Americas as well. They, you know, set up in New England, um, and that's kind of what you need to know about them. The next thing that you need to kind of recall from your unit two stuff is just what a proprietary colony is stuff about the proprietary colonies and the kind of definition what they are can be found on page 78 you know proprietary colony it's run by owners uh, instead of like a royal colony is the king so proprietor means owner so a proprietary colony means that it has owners that's basically what you need to know about proprietary colonies, just kind of the difference between, you know, the proprietary colonies, the royal colonies, different types of colonies. Now we will move on to talk about Unit 3 and uh, the Road to Revolution and that stuff. In Unit 3, we are looking at the situations and circumstances that lead the American colonies to want to break away from Britain. The problems that they have with Britain, the ideas that shape how they feel about those problems, and um, just what that all leads to. We first have to understand how they start thinking the way they start thinking, and it has to do with these two movements, the Great Awakening and the Enlightenment. Both of these 
are on page 131. The Enlightenment goes through 132 as well. The Great Awakening was a religious movement uh, swept through the colonies. They would, uh, traveling ministers, like in this picture, would draw a big crowd and uh, everybody would come listen to what they had to say. The idea here is that you can uh, break away from the past and instead of you know being tied down to what happened in the past the great awakening preach that no matter what your mistakes are you can break away and that's a very american idea and it allows the americans start to see to start to think about maybe breaking away from past traditions like kings and other laws like that the enlightenment is the next one it's a very important movement that sweeps through the american colonies and kind of the whole world the enlightenment basically focuses around human reason and science basically if you've thought about like the scientific process like you have uh, or the scientific method whatever you call it you you have this process that you follow you have like this hypothesis and then you experiment with it and then you're trying to get a result well if you know if you have if you have something that you want to get to and your experiment is not getting you that result then you have to change something about your experiment or about the process that's what the enlightenment's all about it's about following human reason following a path to get to knowledge and to get to the right answer so this extends to governments because of this guy john locke's um, sayings and teachings on the Enlightenment. So John Locke is on page 132. This is John Locke, in case you're wondering. Um, this is the guy that said you, you have natural rights, life, liberty, and property. So you have these three things that all, like all people should have and all people should um, not have taken away from them. And John Locke, using those Enlightenment ideas about having a process, and if it's not working for you, you should change the process. He says that if the government isn't protecting your natural rights, and isn't giving you these rights, and isn't helping you out, and it's not working for you, then you aren't achieving the goal that you're trying to achieve, so you need to change something about the process. And he, what he says you should change about the process is the government. So if the government isn't protecting your natural rights, you should change or abolish the government. That's the whole idea that John Locke's um, talking about when it comes to governments and the Enlightenment ideas and natural rights. To understand why the English th feel that they have these rights and then why the English settlers in America feel that they have these rights, you have to understand where the English rights come from. And it all starts with the document called the Magna Carta. It's on page 137. The Magna Carta is the first document that guarantees rights to any English people. Um, with the Magna Carta, it was more focused on guaranteeing rights to English nobles, so people that are higher up, not like the everyday person. But it's still a step in the right direction. The Magna Carta sets up, it, um, you know, it limits the king's power. It makes sure that they can't just seize, you know, property whenever they want. And there's no taxing without a vote or consent or something. So, the Magna Carta is a step in the right direction. Uh, the years go on after this. The Magna Carta was in 1215, so we, you know, fast forward 400, 500 years, and we're to the time where we're looking at William and Mary. Uh, this is William. These are William and Mary. This is a picture of them. But King James is in charge at first. This guy right here. Um, he takes away a lot of the rights um, from the people both in England and in the colonies so people don't like him so Parliament who we will talk about in just a second but they are the people that are making the laws Parliament wants to get rid of him so they get rid of him they kick him out and they offer the throne to William and Mary and William and Mary her husband and wife um, Mary is James, this little guy over here, um, James's uh, daughter. So they give her the crown and her husband. This whole 
story, this whole change in power to William and Mary is called the Glorious Revolution, and this whole thing can be played out on page 140. So, uh, the Glorious Revolution, you have to connect these two things to that. William and Mary and Glorious Revolution go together, so whenever you see those things, you know what that is. Now, that means that the colonists now have a little bit more rights, and they take steps to gain even more rights and a new right with the P John Peter Zinger trial, which is on page 141. Uh, John Peter Zinger is a guy that is a newspaper publisher, and he publishes a story that is criticizing the New York governor. He's saying that the governor is taking bribes and all around is just a bad dude, and he is, and he deserves, the people deserve that, that information because it's true. Um, but the governor's like, hey man, don't don't say things that are bad about me. I don't like that. So he throws John Peter Zinger in jail. Well, when that happens, he goes to court, and Andrew Hamilton defends him, saying that everyone should have the right to speak the truth. So you should be able to print stuff in the newspaper about somebody as long as it's true. So the bribes and stuff, that's okay to print because that's true. Now, if John Peter Zinger just wanted to print something to make him look bad, that's a different story. So if he said, you know, the governor in New York likes to go out in the middle of the night, dress up like a woman, and like kill puppies in the middle of the street, well, that's not a good thing to say about anybody, and it's not true, so you can't just make him look bad by saying this. So as long as it's true, it's all right, and this establishes the freedom of press. So the English are over in the colonies. We, we know that the colonies are expanding rapidly, and because of that, they are going to be pushing out from this pink area into the yellow area which is controlled by the French and when you go out into this area there is going to be a lot of conflict that's what the X's are, X's are conflict um, so the French and Indian War is caused by these British settlers moving into French territory uh, this is all played out starts on page 143 but then it goes through like 148 you just need to know kind of the general idea of what happened in the war why it was caused why it was fought what happened during those battles and then who won the French and Indian War is a part of a larger war called the Seven Years War and then it is ended by the Treaty of Paris which we have talked about so that means that the British get all of this new land over here and the British settlers start moving into that new land. Well, when they start moving in there, there's still conflict, X's, right? Yeah, okay, um, with Native Americans. And it, that costs the British a lot of money. So they want to get rid of this conflict. So what they do is they put this line in, right here, this red line, back behind the Appalachian Mountains. And this is the Proclamation of 1763. This is on page one. 48. So at the end of the war they put in the proclamation of 1763 and it says that you as a British settler cannot move into the or it, west of the Appalachian Mountains. That angers a lot of people because the proclamation of 1763 says you can't move four bays them from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains and that's the land that they just fought for in this war. So they get a little angry about that. Well they're also angry because the people who are passing the proclamation of 1763, they are parliament. Parliament um, can be found on page 139, so going back a little bit for that definition. But parliament, they're passing, they're the lawmaking body of England, and they are making things like the proclamation of 1763 and also the Quartering Act and Stamp Act and Sugar Act, which we'll get to in a little bit. But... The main issue here is Parliament doesn't get any input from the colonies. There's no representation. There's no say from the colonies. So they are 3,000 miles away making all these laws, and the colonists get really angry about that. Um, to enforce the proclamation of 1763, they passed the Quartering Act, which sends 10,000 troops to the American colonies to patrol and make sure everybody's following the rules. Well, the way we, we talk, and 
this goes along with the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act and everything like that. We we talk about in my class with if if we were going to make a big decision as a school, like the Proclamation of 1763, the Quartering Act, the Sugar Act, the Tea Act, the Stamp Act, those are all really big decisions in the eyes of the colonists. So if we were going to make a big decision in the school, like we were going to introduce a lunch tax, so there was going to be a 50 cent lunch tax and because of that 50 cent lunch tax you were going to get to eat like there was going to be new food in the cafeteria like Pizza Hut and Subway and Taco Bell and McDonald's and things like fast food um, now that's that seems like a pretty good deal like that'd be nice to have but then we decide that only one group out of the school is going to have to pay for this tax so it's either going to be the seventh graders or the eighth graders well we have this school-wide vote like we've talked about with the representative government so we pick representatives from each class they go up to the office and they vote well during the vote they say okay only classrooms with seventh grade students are able to vote on this lunch tax what that's going to mean is that the only people that are voting are seventh graders and because of that they're not really going to represent you eighth graders in the way that you want to be represented and that's going to lead to you having to end up to pay paying the tax uh, for the lunch so it's not really fair to you to not have that representation when you are going to have to get taxed or get mo or get money taken away from you and that is exactly how the colonists feel like in this situation the seventh graders are parliament and you are the english colonies parliament is deciding who gets to pay who has to pay what they have to pay um, and you know as long as it's not them they're all right with it so if it's the colonies or you eighth graders um, that's better for the parliament and England and all that so they make the quartering act they make the stamp act they don't have any representation they get really angry so they start doing things like protesting boycotting um, a lot of it's all led and organized by the sons of liberty on page 158 one thing that they organize that is a uh, big famous event in American history is the Boston Tea Party. Um, this is, of course, the story that, uh, well, you can find this on page 166. You know, they toss all the tea off, they go into the harbor in the middle of the night, they toss all the tea, they destroy tens of thousands of dollars worth of product of the English government. And the English government obviously gets really mad about the Boston Tea Party because they just destroyed a whole bunch of stuff. So what the British do to punish Boston for the Boston Tea Party, because this is this this is the instant. This the Boston Tea Party makes the British so angry that they go, We are not compromising, we are not letting you just decide what taxes you want to pay and throwing your little hissy fit about the T tax we are going to make you follow the rules we're putting our foot down we're drawing the line um, the intolerable acts can be found on page 168 through 170 sorry 169 through 170 um, this picture over here tells you exactly what the intolerable acts do but the point here is that they are to punish Boston that's the idea. The, the, the intolerable acts are meant to punish Boston for the Boston Tea Party. Well, you know, it does a lot of pretty tough stuff. I mean, it takes away royal, it takes away uh, representative government. There's no more town meetings. There's a new quartering act. It closes the port. And everybody gets really, really angry. So the colonies come together. They send representatives to meet. They come together. They talk about how they can fix this, how they can get around this. And they do this by meeting with the first Continental Congress. This is on page 171. I'm just going to scratch that out. Let's start over. 171. Basically, you have a group of representatives. They meet in Philadelphia, and they decide two things. They vote on two things. They're going to ban trade with Britain, and they're, they want colonies to start training troops because they foresee a fight about to happen and because of all these quartering acts and the stamp act and the intolerable acts and just a whole bunch of stuff that the colonists really don't like so these they start training troops and in Massachusetts they start training troops because you know Massachusetts Boston they're like the same 
place, yeah. Um, Boston is in Massachusetts. So they start training training troops because this this is really close to home for them. And they start storing ammunition in a few cities, Lexington and Concord. The British do not like this idea of the colonists storing all of this ammunition and whatnot. So this is going to lead to a little bit of conflict. Uh, battles of Lexing Lexington and Concord, 173 through 174. You have the British in Boston. They are going to be moving towards Lexington and Concord to destroy the ammunition, to destroy all of that stuff and fight and capture some of the colonial leaders. Well, this is the whole story of Paul Revere and his midnight ride, and the British are coming, the British are coming, like which direction they're going, and you know, warning everybody. Well, long story short, the British get to these towns. There's a little bit of a fight because the colonists are really outnumbered, but then they get to this bridge and the colonists kind of are on even playing field now. They start taking heavy casualties from the British. A lot of British guys are dying and they start retreating. And because of Paul Revere and his midnight ride and the word getting out and these, you know, this vast network of communication, nearly 4,000 Minutemen arrive in the area and as the British are retreating, they are getting just shot at from the woods by all these Minutemen that are just behind these trees and stuff. So they suffer heavy casualties and they're almost destroyed before they actually get all the way back to Boston and they retreat all the way back there. But, the, but these are two battles that break out and what we refer to these as are the, they are the first battles of the revolution. So that's the important thing about that. Alright, so that is the first quarter recorded study guide you know study hard tonight uh, watch this video again and do well on your QA tomorrow uh, you'll have an opportunity to get on Facebook and Twitter tonight if you wanna watch the video with us and ask questions anything that you might have from your study guide or the video um, but uh, yeah good luck studying and good luck on the test